In this series of Horses Explained, we're looking into everything that makes up a horse. Today, I'm going to be joined by vet and European specialist in equine internal medicine, Andy Durham. Andy's going to be talking to us about the horse's hormones, and I'm really curious to find out, are we able to avoid conditions like laminitis by gaining a better understanding of our horse's hormones and what management we can provide for them? Let's go and see what Andy's got to say. Okay, Andy, thank you so much for joining us today to talk about hormones. Obviously, we're not going to be going into those that relate to the reproductive system because that's going to be in another episode. But what role do hormones play? What do they do? Yeah, well, hormones really are messengers that spread messages around the body from one place to another. Uh, many hormones come from the base of the brain, actually, from the pituitary gland, which is a central regulator. And if you like, it's another way of the brain communicating with other parts of the body rather than through the nerves. They can uh, just send hormones out which travel through the bloodstream and go to another part of the body to, to send a message that another part of the body needs to do something. Uh, not all hormones come from there though. Uh, one of the other hormones I think we'll be talking about today, um, insulin comes from the pancreas which is uh, uh, attached to the upper part of the small intestine and there are many other organs around the body that release hormones they're generally referred to as endocrine mm -hmm. tissue and the uh, endocrine system is another um, term if you like for the hormonal system around the body but it, it, essentially they're just messenger chemicals that go from one part of the body to another and in terms of diseases that horses are susceptible to like ppid and insulin dysregulation how do hormones link in with those yeah, well, they're an essential feature of both of those two conditions. Um, they, they are both PPID and insulin dysregulation and equine metabolic syndrome uh, are incredibly common conditions in horses. Um, it's interesting, really, that going back in time, they really didn't get an awful lot of attention uh, in the veterinary education or with vets in practice. But I think now we realise how common they are. Um, these horses are around everywhere and uh, hormones are at the, the root of both of those conditions. Uh, PPID, or used to be referred to as equine Cushing's disease, PPID stands for pituitary pass intermedia dysfunction because it's the pass intermedia or the intermediate part if you like of the pituitary gland uh, which sits at the base of the brain that becomes dysfunctional in PPID and starts to produce an excessive amount of various different hormones. It, interestingly it's a condition we understand very well now PPID uh, we've been studying it in detail for many years but we still strangely don't have a great grasp of mm. all of the hormones that are coming out of the dysfunctional pass intermedia in okay. PPID. Uh, the, there are clearly many of them, uh, some are more important than others and my guess would be that when we get to understand this condition better in the future probably some horses will have more of one hormone, another will have more of another so it may well be that there are lots of different subtypes but, but nevertheless with PPID there's a whole soup of different hormones if you like coming out of the dysfunctional pituitary gland that will travel in the bloodstream around the body and have various effects uh, around the body. Um, and how can we best support our horses and make sure that we are you know giving them the best environment to sort of nurture their hormones and support that balance? Yeah well I suppose with, with PPID uh, there's uh, the, the the actual trigger factors for it the cause of it isn't terribly well understood it's clearly something that's associated with aging mm. um, but it, it is related to oxidative damage uh, which accumulates over the years to the pituitary gland um, and so I suppose oxidative support or antioxidant support mm -hmm. um, although that's not established as a preventative or anything it would make perfect sense that that we should be mindful of that really I think uh, one circumstance I think where the lack of antioxidants in a horse's diet uh, is, is bound to occur is, is typically through the winter or, e or even summer I suppose if you're on preserved forage if a, if a horse is primarily just getting you know hay or haylage as opposed to green food antioxidants are likely to be lacking in that and uh, so I think when horses are on that kind of food then supplementation with antioxidants of some type will probably make sense you know vitamin E vitamin C that kind of thing really. No, that's really interesting and I would say that that links in with 
you know, some of the things that we feed our horses here, we provide a lot of our youngsters with a vitamin C supplement, just so that we know that they are getting those nutrients that they need, you know, whether we can't get it from the ground or not. Um, and so for day-to-day -day management, why is it so important that we consider hormones? Well, I suppose the, the, the key one for day-to-day -day management that uh, affects so many different horses uh, would be insulin and insulin mm -hmm. dysregulation. Um, in, insulin is a hormone that uh, as people, as horses, as dogs, cats, whatever, animals in general, release insulin after you've eaten something. Mm -hmm. um, and basically what insulin's there to do is to store all of the, the nutrients that you've just eaten. It's a uh, you know, basic function like that. But, uh, but unfortunately, very high levels of insulin uh, can be quite damaging, particularly mm -hmm. to the laminae in horses. And they are the main cause, that is the main cause of laminitis in horses. Uh, very high levels of insulin released because of what the horse has eaten and, uh, and to a certain extent the nature of the horse. Some horses and ponies are more likely to release more insulin than others but, but ultimately when they've eaten something, if they hyper secrete, if they secrete uh, excessive amounts of insulin, the, the laminae will be damaged and you know as we all know laminitis is a, a massive threat to not just ponies you know it, it, it is a problem with with horses uh, many breeds of horses particularly as perhaps they get older and less fit and put a bit of weight on yeah. as well um, and so we should always be mindful of that what a horse is eating what its body condition is because undoubtedly the fatter horses are more likely to release more insulin as well making them more prone to laminitis but but ultimately I think the thing we should never forget is that insulin is still only released in response to what they've just eaten and so you can always modify the insulin release by changing not necessarily the quantity of what they're eating but the actual quality of, of what they're eating uh, in, in general terms diets with higher sugar contents will cause more insulin to be released and increase the risk of laminitis then um, so uh, certainly allowing horses probably to, to to, to eat plenty. I don't think any of us like to see horses kind of massively restricted so they haven't got much to eat and they're staring over the fence all day. They want lots to eat but the quality of what they eat must be diluted out in terms of its uh, sugar content to, to moderate the amount of insulin that they're releasing and avoid laminitis in that way and that, that undoubtedly is the you know the main impact and the main thought we, we should be having about hormones in, in horses just controlling insulin release. And I think it's a really valid point that you make about, you know, it's a common misconception that, you know, it might just be our little overweight Shetlands that might be prone to laminitis, but actually there are so many other factors that can cause it. And it isn't just among our little tiny friends. It, you know, can be experienced by all of our horses. Oh, absolutely right. I mean, we've already mentioned uh, PPID and Cushing's disease, you know, any, you know, if my skinny thoroughbred you know who develops PPID later on in life can be prone to laminitis undoubtedly yeah. and uh, and certainly uh, at, at other stages you know warm bloods I think are often uh, underestimated you know we must remember where warm bloods came from in the first place they do have quite a few native genes in them actually from being bred from local breeds around Europe or whatever and uh, and you know they, they can be very prone to putting weight on yeah. and getting laminitis and you know I suppose it would be fair to say that laminitis is generally a bit more common in ponies but as, as you say you get it in all breeds and undoubtedly when you get it in a horse it tends to be more serious because uh, simply because of the excessive weight yeah. that they're carrying on those damaged laminae um, so yeah it's something that uh, no, absolutely no horse is uh, immune from as it were. And in terms of the insulin production that you were talking about is that quite a quick process in terms of you know from horse going from eating to then it's working its way through the body do they generate that quite fast? Yeah the, the response in terms of releasing insulin is pretty quick. Uh, there'll be some insulin released you know literally within minutes of eating something but it probably peaks a couple of hours later. Okay. It's a, a, a slow increase to the peak. Um, as regards that insulin if it's an excessive amount mm. of insulin as regards that damaging the laminae and triggering laminitis it's less clear at the moment at least anyway how high the insulin needs to be and for how long before laminae are damaged but certainly experimental studies would suggest that from uh, a massive insulin peak to 
damage to the lamini that you can see in mm. terms of a painful horse probably takes 36 48 hours something okay. like that uh, but uh, there is also at the other end of the spectrum undoubtedly uh, a more sort of under the radar smoldering type of laminitis where presumably insulin concentrations that aren't mega high mm. but they're high nevertheless can damage the lamini without necessarily showing any overt pain at all and so laminitis is actually occurring and in many ways it's a more dangerous form of laminitis because people aren't necessarily aware it's happening so you bring your pony in from the uh, from the grass that day and you think well he's walking okay so that yeah. must have been all right but nevertheless there is damage occurring which can be cumulative over time and uh, and certainly when the foot is examined um, you know by a vet by a farrier whatever you can see really clear clear changes of laminitis but as far as the owner's concerned their pony or horse has never ever been lame and, uh, and that, that is quite a difficult one to deal with. Yeah no and I think it is progressive like you say and it's not always going to go straight from oh my horse is standing happily in the field and to then you know you know really having that sort of leaning back stance and you go oh that horse looks laminitic i know that we had a horse return recently who'd been away at a lone home she's an older mare um and she was uh trotted up on her arrival um and just seemed slightly off um but there wasn't anything that was particularly sort of i'm gonna say uh, you know outstandingly obvious mm. um but then when we tested her with hoof testers and our vet and farrier had a look she was experiencing laminitic changes mm. but it was just early onset and so it was okay okay let's how can we manage her how can mm. we make sure that we're supporting her as best as possible and how do we catch this as early as possible mm. so that we aren't allowing this progression to continue yeah that's absolutely right you know it's something that's really frustrating in many ways that how laminitis almost becomes tolerated by people you know the num number of times through my career i've heard somebody casually say oh my pony's always a bit footy in the spring you know, nothing I can do about it. It's always a bit footy in the spring. I mean, that's just awful, that statement. Yeah. You know, that's essentially saying my pony has laminitis every yeah. spring and I'm not doing anything yeah, about, about it. it. Um, and, you know, laminitis isn't either on or off. There's whole grades in mm. between times, in between those extremes. And, and we should never be tolerant of any part no. of it, really. If, uh, if there's evidence laminitis is there, it's always going to be progressive unless we do something about it. You know, laminitis will always recur unless you do something about the fundamental causes. And that's mm. the thing, it is about making sure that we are supporting them and, you know, enabling the right system and format for them. Yeah, you know? yeah. essentially, as I mentioned earlier on, essentially all laminitis that we see is as a consequence of excessive insulin release. Yeah. And that's always a good place to start then. You know, you, you can just see, you know, you can have your pony out in a, in a field for an hour. What's his insulin like afterwards? Is it OK? In which case, yeah, that's fine. That's safe then. Or is it a really scary number? In which case we've got to modify that management. And, and the same would apply you know, to even hay nets or whatever. I think, I think if we were having this conversation probably five or ten years ago, we very much would have attributed all the laminitis to grass yep. and everything else is OK. But, but it just isn't the case. You know, we see so many laminitis cases on, on, in ponies and horses. Well, all they're have, having really is hay. Yep. And I suppose you, when you think about it, it never really made sense that hay was OK and grass <laughs> wasn't. Because, I mean, what's hay? It's dehydrated grass. You know, the sugar doesn't evaporate. No. It's the water that evaporates. The sugar stays there. And if you can have high sugar, sugar grass you can have high sugar hay and there's no doubt we do you know we would see plenty of blood samples that come into us when mm. a when a when a pony or a horse has just been eating hay and nothing else with sky high insulin values which without any doubt will be damaging the lamini so uh, so yeah we've, we've absolutely got to focus on on what they're eating and, and the consequence of what they're eating not necessarily always how much but it is it is the quality and what the uh, effect on their insulin is and if a horse owner was concerned potentially about the you know the levels within their horse's blood is that something that they could get you know checked by a vet yeah so you can measure the insulin responses just from a, a simple blood test that blood test has to be targeted time wise to what the horse has just eaten um, so you, you could just have a look after a period of grazing mm -hmm. um, after a hard feed after a hay net or whatever and the vet can come out and advise on the exact timing yeah. roughly you're talking about an hour or two after eating something but that can vary a little bit depending on what exactly it is uh, but uh, we, we, we know that the insulin will peak around about an hour or two 
after eating something so we can use that simple blood test to measure the insulin in, in the blood as an indicator of whether that's a nice kind of low okay mm. kind of insulin so we don't have to worry about that part of the management or wow that insulin is kind of really high and that's worrying as regards the lamine so we're going to have to modify that part of the diet you know whether that's the grazing bit whether that's the hay whether it's the hard feed but if we can identify which bit provokes high insulin from the blood tests then uh, then we can target that and modify that. The diet really informs all of these hormonal changes that horses can experience. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's the elements of the diet, you know, notably sugars, but mm. uh, there may be other things in there too that have some effect, but notably sugars that stimulate insulin release. And it's the insulin release that damages the lamina. It's a very straightforward process and a straightforward link there. You know, PPID that we mentioned is, is probably less clear exactly how PPID itself mm. Uh, leads to laminitis but undoubtedly it's through insulin again it's through insulin dysregulation uh, that uh, that leads to laminitis again so you know there are a few other minority causes of laminitis but by far by far the majority of laminitis cases we see are simply related to high insulin concentrations no and so what would be your sort of final key message for horse owners and what they can do yeah, well, I think, I think probably the, the biggest change in the approach we have to prevention of laminitis now is targeting elements of the diet mm -hmm. and working out what it is that's causing it. Because as, as I mentioned, we, we certainly can't just say it's grass and nothing no. else. Um, we, we really need to know what it is and if we can identify elements of the diet that are just simply unsuitable then they can be modified in so many ways. Um, you know if, if it is grazing obviously you've either got to reduce the amount of grazing put a grazing muzzle on something like that. If it's a hard feed then obviously that can be modified there's a hundred different hard feeds high sugar low sugar whatever that can be changed now. And, and with hay, I know the traditional approach to dealing with hay being a problem has been to soak it, I suppose. And there's, uh, that certainly can be effective, but it's very variably effective. Um, I, I, there's more research these days uh, coming into mixing straw in with hay, which I think is you know it's an infinitely easier thing to do actually you know soaking hay is a bit of a pain and there's, there's kind of environmental consequences of the effluent from it all that kind of thing so just mixing some straw in with the hay can be really valuable and mo most native type types can probably take up to 50 50 hay and straw even more sometimes yep. and the donkeys can probably be completely on straw actually but straw tends to provoke little if any insulin response and diluting the hay out with that so they've still got plenty to eat they can eat it all day long yeah but it's not stimulating the same kind of insulin secretion. Yeah, and I've got two Highland ponies, so I can definitely relate on the, you know, native weight gain, you know, prime ponies. And I do have to give them a half hay and half straw, you know, if they are going to be in for, I'm going to say, extended periods of time, you know, if they're not just coming in for handling purposes, because I want to be able to make sure that I am restricting them where possible, but still allowing them to get the forage that mm. they need. And, you know, they are, naturally going to be prone to those conditions that we've spoken about so it's just you know making those small changes that it's not difficult making those small adjustments just to you know try and prolong and you know prom promote their health for as long as possible yeah and it promotes so many different forms of health and their mental health because they've got so much to eat they're not standing mm. there with nothing to eat their digestive health improves from it and so the laminitis does too and you know those kind of ponies did not evolve to eat lush green berry <laughs> grass. You know, they, they, it is completely alien to them. So actually mixing straw in with hay is far more akin yeah. to the diet they would have evolved to eat. So they do really well on it and, uh, and it suits their, their health tremendously well. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been very insightful. Um, so thank you so much for your time. Hey, you're very welcome. What a brilliant conversation. Not only did we learn that hormones affect and regulate the horse's bodily functions and their metabolism, but did you know that hormones can influence serious conditions that our horses might be susceptible to, like Cushing's and laminitis? And he's given us some really useful tips on how we can manage our horses and make sure that we are monitoring their hormones as best as we can. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to click that like button, drop us a comment down below. I want to know what you've learned about hormones. And finally, subscribe to World Horse Welfare's YouTube channel. Together, we can follow more episodes of delving into what makes up our horses and how can we tailor their management to make sure that they are as happy and healthy as they can be.